in the McMaster community and represents Canada on the world stage as far as his virology goes. And uh, she'll maybe tell us a little bit about that before we're done. So a special welcome to all of you guys. And in order to introduce Karen, my hope is that we don't have to do the bio, the bio again because it's been in our newsletter twice and I'm sure all of you have read through it. I'd, I'd like to find out what Karen is doing right now and in the last, say, couple of years that she's kind of proud of in her job at McMaster. Karen, can you tell us some of those things? Sure. Well, again, thanks, everyone. Sorry that we had to go to part two, tech, uh, technology and internet uh, issues. Um, so in the last several months, it's been, you know, exceedingly busy um, in, in wearing two hats at work. Um, you know, this, it, we had to shut down the university within, I think we had a meeting on a Thursday of what we call the crisis management group. And by the Friday, we decided we were going to shut down the university starting the following Monday morning. Um, so, so that was in, um, that was in March. That was in March. And, and so, you know, there's no protocols on how to shut down a university, um, especially overnight. So, you know, from a research perspective, um, that's what I was charged with. And, and it, it, it sounds like it might be somewhat simple, but actually it's not when you have um, ongoing um, experiments, um, a number of different very long term type of experiments, experiments involving patients. Um, so for ethical reasons, it was challenging and we had to be very careful about how we ramped down. So for, for several months, it was how do we um, enable the essential research that has to continue um, while shutting down the rest of campus. And then once we were in a nice stable and had that working, then it was how do you restart, um, how do you restart the university as the uh, province goes back into you know, phase one and phase two. Um, you know, I'm extremely proud of my team because it was really research that led the way. The, we quickly realized that the easiest way to start bringing um, in a phased approach people back on campus and what was most important was the research. So, you know, it was my team that I'm very proud of that uh, really led the, um, you know, how do, how do you start to bring people back onto campus? And that's been the model that's now been used uh, to bring students and faculty uh, back. McMaster certainly is not um, fully back. Um, we ever all of the undergraduate uh, courses are online for the fall. We're now having to make the decision fairly quickly about what's going to happen in the winter. As you can imagine, that's a very challenging um, decision to make because we don't know what's going to happen in January. Um, we obviously want to have um, the community back, but it. Uh, you know, when you think about it, it's a bit different in a university campus. We're in a very, very small geographical location. We have 40,000 people. So the challenges of bringing that density of, of people back um, becomes challenging. So, you know, that's what's really, you know, that's one of the hats that's really been, um, you know, keeping me busy the last several months. And then, of course, the other hat uh, with my own research program, just having to uh, coincidentally um, deal with viruses and obviously you know this virus we've been very actively involved with um, before the pandemic hit um, and I've been in the office of the vice president research I've been very fortunate to be able to travel um, all around the world um, last year alone I think I did almost I was just shy of a hundred thousand miles which um, one thing I love about this particular uh, pandemic is I have not had to spend all my time in airports and on airplanes, so that's actually been um, that's actually been a, a bonus. Um, but I've been very fortunate to travel. I was in India, Israel, um, you know, all over the world um, with with either the university or with uh, different organizations with government. Um, do a lot of interaction with all levels of government. So it's it's been um, it's been a really interesting and exciting uh, position for me. Um, so enough about me and what keeps me busy. I'm going to see if I can share my screen now. Hopefully technology. Will allow me to do this. Can you see the, can you see the screen? 
Perfect. Yes. Thank you. All right. So I'm not going to go over everything, um, you know, that I can't remember exactly where it cut off uh, the last time. Um, but I did want to update. I know it was about just over a month ago, um, I think on June 25th. And at that time, I showed you this particular um, screenshot from a website. And at that point, the cases in, um, you know, worldwide were just over 9 million. As you can see, within about a month, we've jumped to 21 million cases. And so on the bottom right hand side, you can see how the daily cases have really spiked over, um, you know, in the last while. So in just over a month, we went from 9 million worldwide to, um, to 21 million. And then, you know, global deaths, about three quarters of a million. Now, in contrast, um, you can see this is Canada specific now. Again, we in June, we had 104,000 um, cases and we're only at 124,000 now. And as you can see again on the daily cases in the, in the bottom right, you know, we had that initial surge and then Canada has been re remarkably effective in, in containing. Um, so I know a lot of, um, you know, people are, are getting very frustrated um, with some of the public health rules, but uh, you can see from a global perspective, I think Canada's done a remarkable job in containing the virus. And I think that's in part because the border to the states is still closed. And I hope it stays that way for a while. But, um, and you can see on the map, the, you know, the vast difference between the states and, and Canada. So again, this is a phenomenal website. It, it's up updated um, almost minute by minute. So it's, it's really interesting if you want to follow different countries and, and what's happening globally. So I thought I'd talk a little bit again and update about where we are with either a vaccine or a treatment. So as of um, today, there's only one vaccine that's been approved. Um, this is um, in Russia called the Sputnik. It was approved last week. Um, very controversial because they have not um, done the proper clinical trials. This, this was, um, you know, in the news last week. Um, Putin apparently had his own family um, injected, injected his daughter, and used that as a rationale for looking at say if I'm willing to use it on my daughter. Um, you know, very controversial. I'm, I mean, everyone is looking for a vaccine, um, but there are reasons why we do, you know, phase one, two, and three clinical trials, both for safety and for efficacy. Um, so it's, it's a huge gamble that they're taking. Um, if it works, they'll say it was all worth it. At the end of the day, um, you know, I disagree with that personally, but, um, but certainly in the U.S., which is probably the largest uh, group that's working on this, they've um, set up a, a trials network. Um, which is a unit of Operation Warp Speed. So this is um, devoted to, to COVID. Um, partnering with a number of different uh, biopharmaceutical companies on the vaccine um, in different phases of development. Um, right now, they have funded three um, phase three clinical trials. One is Moderna, which you've probably heard of, one from the University of Oxford in the UK, and then one from AstraZeneca. Um, so it's estimated, though, that to do a properly controlled clinical trial, the outcomes won't uh, be available for one to two years because really what happens in a clinical trial you know the first phase is is a very small number of individuals and it's really to look for safety and then phase two and phase three if phase one is successful on safety starts to look at efficacy um, phase two being smaller and then phase three being um, you know very broad to really test for a vaccine like this though you have to engage you know thousands and thousands of individuals half have to have a placebo control, the other half get the vaccine, and then you have to look at what effect that has on, um, on the disease status. And so with this virus where we know it spreads efficiently, but only a very small proportion of the population actually has symptoms, you can see how you know, it would take such a huge amount of time and, and a, a large length of time to really see the efficacy. Um, because you're looking for, are you moving the needle in the number of cases that you're seeing? So when the case rate is actually low, um, you can see where it will take, you know, they're estimating one to two years. And they're looking for a vaccine really to go for approval and to be approved following phase three 
it would have to um, be effective um, by at least a 50% in, in the number of, um, of COVID-19 cases. You know, you think a lot of our vaccines have closer to, you know, 90, 95% efficacy. We know enough about the virus that it's, it's very challenging to induce an immune response against the virus. Even um, individuals that are infected and have cleared their infection are, have um, various um, sort of protections. Some really aren't that protected. And those that do have a protective immune response, it, it appears to wane fairly rapidly. And they saw this with the original SARS as well. So there are definitely challenges with the vaccine. Uh, you know, the good thing is all of the major vaccine um, laboratories and companies are working on a vaccine. So if there's ever going to be one, um, you know, we have all of the right people working on it, but it is, it is a challenge. Um, in Canada, we only have one drug that's been um, approved, remdesivir. Um, it's also been approved in the States and, and more globally. It's a generic antiviral drug. It's not just against um, COVID. Um, it was used against Ebola. Again, it, it works okay. It's not um, obviously, you know, the drug that, um, you know, once you're infected clears all infections, but it, it's better than nothing. And so that is the only a drug so far in Canada that's been approved. And um, currently in Canada, there are 55 clinical trials that have been approved. They're all in various stages for other drugs and vaccines. So if you can imagine 55 clinical trials in Canada worldwide, there's a lot of activity in this area. So again, uh, what have we done in my lab? Um, all of the work was really done by Aaron J. Banerjee, who's the second from right. This is in the high containment level three facility in Toronto where he actually isolated the virus from patient samples. Um, bottom right is an electron micrograph. This is actually from one of the patient samples and this was one of the first confirmations that we had actually isolated the virus. And then of course we used sequencing to verify that that virus is actually SARS-CoV-2 because many viruses will look similar to that on an electron micrograph. So what have we done with it since um, you know, ARNJ was able to isolate it? Well, we've now made um, high titered stocks and we've sent it to collaborators across the country that have a containment level three facility. Um, so that's probably about 10 different universities that have the proper containment level three facility where they can work with the virus. And so we've been able to distribute to um, all of those that have that uh, facility. So now um, we have a number of different research groups working on all different aspects of the virus. We've been really interested in studying the basic biology of the virus, um, looking at what human cell types are infected, how do they know they're infected, how does the virus fight back, um, because this information will really help us not just understand sort of what we're seeing in the clinic, but then also, um, you know, for a inform drug development and vaccine development. We're also working with colleagues to develop assays for testing drugs and animal models to test both drugs and vaccine candidates. We've really started because this is a niche area that we work in studying uh, the virus in bats and in bat cells. Um, and again, a testament to the team that I have here. Since March, we've been able to publish five peer-reviewed manuscripts, which is somewhat a, it's somewhat unheard of. Um, you know, that's sort of the best publication record I've had in, in my 20 years of, of being at McMaster. Um, but it also shows that, you know, when you collaboratively, and this has been a very collaborative effort, um, all hands on board, um, we've been able to get a lot of information out. Um, and, and we have great collaborators that we work with. And what have we found so far? Well, one of the studies, which was more computational, um, certainly not something we did uh, in the lab, but very computational, is we identified the potential for a number of different pathogenic coronaviruses, specifically the SARS coronavirus and MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, to recombine. And so this becomes really important in areas such as the Middle East, where you have both viruses circulating. Um, because again, this now causes the potential uh, where you have two viruses circulating in the same area, if they can, and so we looked at what's the ability of them to infect the same cell, um, looking at the receptors on the cell, and then what's the likelihood that they could recombine and generate a completely new virus. Um, and 
unfortunately, you know, the, um, there are areas of the genome where, where this is possible. So this becomes important information, particularly for areas like the Middle East, just so that they're aware of this, they can, and then, you know, design uh, the right testing and monitoring uh, to make sure that, you know, this is not happening. So that publication just came out. Um, we're really starting to understand how SARS-CoV-2 interacts with the immune system. Um, some of what we've been finding helps to explain a lot of the clinical observations that we're seeing. So, um, you know, we do the, you know, we don't, we're not, I'm not a clinician, uh, we don't work directly with patients, but certainly, you know, some of the basic biology we're discovering of the virus does help to explain why our clinical colleagues are, are seeing um, some of the observations that they're seeing. And then we've been, again, working with, um, with colleagues um, and with the virus to develop sequencing protocols and other protocols so that we can really um, rapidly screen genomes. And, and this becomes really important for high throughput screening so that we can monitor, you know, if the virus is changing, we know that viruses mutate. This one mutates relatively slowly for an RNA virus, which is good. Um, but we can monitor how both geographically and over time, how the virus is changing. And then we try to go back and, um, and understand how those changes will impact on what we see either for vaccine development or, um, or clinically. So as I mentioned, we do, um, you know, we've started a whole new area with bats. And so why bats? And how did I get into this? So I, I personally got into this, again, from Aaron J. Banerjee, the postdoctoral fellow in my lab, because he had done his PhD um, working in bats and bat cells at the University of Saskatchewan with uh, MERS coronavirus. So bats are fascinating. They are highly diverse, um, and there's over 12, um, 1,200 different species of bats. And they range from really, really small, so two grams with 15 centimeter wing, wingspan, all the way up to the, the flying fox, which is closer to two kilograms and you know, a very, almost a two meter wingspan. So huge diversity. They can travel really long distances. So again, if you think about disease and being able to carry and being um, you know, lately infected with a number of pathogens, the ability to travel long distances obviously has implications. And for being very, very small mammals, the ones that we work with are about the size and weight of a mouse. Um, they're very long lived. So mice typically have, um, you know, an age span of two to three years. Some of these bats are up to 40 years, 40 to 50 years. So they're very long lived, which again has implications. But of course, the reason we're most interested in bats is because they're known to carry or harbor um, many, many different types of viruses, but ones that we also know to have um, implications on human and agricultural um, disease. So Ebola and Marburg viruses, rabies, um, some of the paramyxoviruses such as Nipah and Hendra virus, and then of course the coronaviruses. And there, bats are remarkably interesting because they can harbor all of these different types of viruses or families of viruses but without getting sick um, and, and no apparent um, you know evidence of a viral infection actually at all and within one bat they can also find multiple multiple viral species by sequencing um, so it's not just that certain bats have certain viruses, um, you, you know, different types of bats can harbor many, many different families of viruses um, with no apparent symptoms. And so the implication of this is, you know, bats have been implicated in the original SARS outbreak through um, palm civets or civet cats. Again, in the wet market, they think that this is also what happened um, potentially with pangolins or, or other animals um, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so, of course, in you know, in areas where you have really, really dense populations, so China, for example, and within a wet market, you have um, all of these different varieties of animals and bats and humans. Um, it, it's sort of like the perfect storm. And so, you know, this sort of transmission can really happen anywhere. But when you bring all of the components together in a very, very small, uh, you know, high density, very small geographical area, 
the, the potential for that occurring um, increases exponentially. So then you have a cross-species transmission from bats to another to another animal, and then you have the zoonotic transition, um, you know, from these animals into humans. So this is certainly what happened with SARS-CoV-2, um, with MERS. This also happened between bats into camels, and then camels into into humans. Um, and the same is true. Um, they've now shown for um, for this particular coronavirus. So we're really fortunate um, because we have a, a great colleague. This is Dr. Paul Four. He's in the Faculty of Science, and he has a bat lab at McMaster. Um, and so he has, it's a unique facility in Canada, and it's actually a unique facility in the world. It's one of the only facilities in the world where he has both wild caught bats, but they'll also breed in captivity. And so that's very unusual. So there are a number of different labs around the world where they'll have um, wild caught bats, but this is one of the only ones where they'll actually breed in captivity. So then you can have multi generations, and then so you can look at, you know, um, spread between generations and um, vertical transmission. So it, it really enables studies that can't be done anywhere else. And so Paul goes out every spring. Um, he has his same locations where he collects bats in the wild, um, basically from he has a, a few individuals he's met um, years and years ago that have uh, bats in their attic. So he goes to the same um, areas and, and every spring does a catch of, of new bats and brings them in. Obviously, they have to go through quarantine to make sure they don't have rabies. Um, every once in a while, one will be found to be rabies positive. Um, everyone that works in the facility has to be uh, vaccinated against rabies and show that they have titers. Um, it's, it's a really neat, um, it's both an indoor, which you see on the left, but then also an outdoor facility where they can fly into an outdoor um, location, especially in the summer, not in the winter. And the bats are, as I said, these are, they're called the Canadian big brown bat. They're actually the size of a mouse. The Canadian small brown bat is basically the size of your thumb. Um, we can't work with small brown bats because they're um, they're on a um, on a list because they can be infected with white nose fungus, and so they they're protected. Um, but these are the Canadian big brown bats. And what they when I first went into this facility, I could see I could hear them and I could smell them, but I couldn't see them. Um, so I wasn't sure where they were sort of hiding. Well, they like to hide in these wooden structures, and so you can see inside of one of these. And then this is just, this is a towel. So, you know, very, very high tech. This is an old towel that's basically um, on a hanger and it's folded over. And when you lift up one of the, the corners, there could be, you know, upwards of 50 to 100 bats in, in here because they love to huddle together, especially when it's cold. Um, and so they'll, um, they'll huddle together. So Paul works on um, echolocation and, and hearing, um, but it's a great facility. Um, it's a great facility to work with and he's been a great collaborator. So we now have the ability to, uh, you know, to do and ask questions that, uh, that no one else can, can really ask. And so here's an example of um, a manuscript that came out um, just a couple of months ago. This is again from Aaron Jay, and this is the type of research that we do. So what we're, what we're looking at is what is the difference between um, bats and humans? So again, bats are mammals. Their immune system is very, very similar to our immune system because they are mammals. Um, but yet bats can be infected with all of these different viral families and viruses and they don't appear to get sick. And so one of the things that we found is, so poly IC, this is like a double-stranded RNA. So this is a genomic material. Um, Many, many viruses are made from, from double-stranded RNA. And what happens is when cells are infected with a, a virus, there's, you know, at some point in the replication life cycle of a virus, double-stranded RNA is made, and that's a trigger to activate the um, immune response within those cells. And so this is one of the pathways, you don't need to know the details, one of the pathways um, for activating a protein called interferon. And interferon is probably one of the first proteins that's made when you become infected with a virus. And interferon is there to protect both the infected cell, but also as a signal to surrounding cells to protect themselves. 
And so when interferon is made, one of the sequelae of interferon is the feeling of um, lethargy, achiness, you know, a headache, a fever. So when you experience those symptoms, which are typical of a viral infection, it's because your body is making proteins such as interferon. And so what we found is one single amino acid that's different between this particular protein in bats and this particular protein in humans. So only one amino acid was, was different. And it's because of this one amino acid that bats have a really heightened ability to make interferon, whereas humans don't. And so in the lab, we can basically put this protein into bat cells and put this protein into human cells and basically turn a human immune response into a bat immune response and vice versa. So the more we understand about these really, really, really small differences and how bats can protect themselves, we can start to use that knowledge to figure out how now clinically, how can we um, you know, use this knowledge to, to basically turn a human immune response into a bat immune response and, and then be protected against all of these different viral infections. So that's the type of work that we do there. So that's all I wanted. I wanted to leave time for questions. That just sort of gives a really brief overview of, uh, of the type of work that my lab does and where we're at. Um, and again, all of the credit. Uh, I'm not in the lab anymore, which I miss, but I'm not in the lab anymore. So all the credit goes to those in my, in my lab that actually do all the work. So I will stop sharing my screen and unmute. I think people are on. Right, Karen? Everybody's on uh, mute, Bob. Okay. So how do we get off mute? So I just unmuted all from my end, but people might have individually muted themselves. I don't remember where I found it. <laughs> okay. Karen, I have a, a question for you. Sure. Uh, there's been a number of reports out about, and you mentioned it, about the mutation of this virus. And how is that affecting research and the timeline for developing an effective virus or uh, an effective vaccine? Because you would think that as the, the virus continues to mutate, it kind of moves along. And um, how, how does the research and how everything, how does it keep up with that to, to develop an effective uh, um, vaccine? So that's a great question. And, you know, all viruses are different and the ability to mutate, um, is different for every virus. So HIV is a classic example where it it mutates very, very rapidly. And this is one of the reasons why we don't have a vaccine yet for HIV, um, because it mutates so rapidly and it can mutate within the particular protein that we would be targeting for, um, for a vaccine development, one of the proteins on the outside of the virus. What we've seen with this particular virus is it, its mutational rate is actually very, very low for an RNA virus. Um, so it is mutating, but certainly not to the extent that we see with other viruses like HIV. And where we are seeing the mutations are in um, not necessarily in the spike protein. So the spike protein is the protein on the outside of the virus. So in that you know, picture, it's that the red sort of spikes on the outside. That's what enables the virus to bind to cells and get into cells. And that's what's being targeted by the vaccine because of course it's on the outside of the virus and so that's what antibodies are trying to look for. Because this virus really only has the spike protein to get into cells, if it mutates that protein too drastically so that vaccine development won't work, it's also gonna mutate so drastically that it won't be able to bind and get into cells, right? So, so it, it's, you know, we are seeing subtle mutations in spike, but if it, if it mutates too much to get around the vaccine, it might even mutate to the point where it can't actually bind and then get into cells. And so that's why, you know, once we know the exact positions and, and know enough about the spike protein, and what's absolutely essential for it to bind and get into cells, that's the area that is targeted by the vaccine. 
So it will have some implications, but fortunately, um, you know, it is sufficiently different um, than, than viruses like HIV, which um, even within a single individual that is HIV positive, if you were to sequence viruses within an individual, there would be thousands of different sequences. So gentlemen, you can signal you have a question by putting your hand up, something like this on the screen, will let us know that you have a question available. Al Greger. Yes, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm going to have to mute. On the weekend, I uh, encountered some. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're on mute. On the weekend, I encountered some oh, some speculation that uh, we might find a feature on the coronavirus that would give us immunity against multiple diseases such as SARS, MERS, and COVID through a single uh, vaccine. Is that a realistic uh, hope in any way? Potentially. So, you know, these, um, all of these coronaviruses are similar enough that, for example, if you were to look at an electron micrograph, um, you, you couldn't tell the difference between them. So structurally, they're similar enough, you can't tell a difference. At the sequence level, they're sufficiently different um, that having you know, one, um, one vaccine that targets all of them is unlikely because they're still, they all use a spike protein to get in, but the spike proteins themselves are sufficiently different. I mean, that's certainly the goal, but um, there, there's not enough similarity between all of them that I think that would be challenging. Another question. John? John Carley? Yes, I was just wondering, is there uh, um, an average number of the virus that, that you would have to inhale or be exposed to before you catch it? Like, could it be one or is it 10,000? Or do we know that? Yeah, that's a, so that's a great question. And it's not gonna be the same number for everybody. So with these, um, you know, viruses that are really upper respiratory tract and you really get from in, you know, from inhaling from basically mucus surfaces or mucosal surfaces, um, you have what's called your intrinsic immunity. And that's things like the mucus layer, um, you know, dead cells before a virus can actually reach a cell. So there's a lot of intrinsic uh, barriers. And of course, that's going to be different for every person. And then you have your innate response, which is those first couple of cells that get infected, how rapidly can that cell respond? And so, and everybody is different. Um, but there's certainly, um, you know, the concept that there has to be a certain number of viruses just, you know, to get through. Um, but, it, it, but it's hard to say what that number is because it's likely going to be different for, for every person because there's so many different barriers and, and different, um, you know, layers that, you know, the virus actually needs before it can take hold. Um, <coughs> but it's certainly, you know, the exposure level if you're, expo and this is why healthcare workers um, working with patients, um, you know, that are actively um, infected and they're doing, you know, ventilation and, and whatnot, why they're at the highest risk, because the likelihood of them coming into contact with a much, much higher density of the virus is greater. Jerry, you, do you have a question? Oh, yes, I can have a question. It gets, <laughs> gets down to practical things. We're so concerned about getting it and we're in the age group that at one time we thought we were the most susceptible. I'm not sure that's still true or not because I hear lots of reports that lots of younger people are getting it because they're not social distancing. However, what can we really do? Like um, we've been told to wash our hands, keep social distancing, wear masks. What else can we do to make it safer for us, hopefully for the time being? Yeah, so when you when you think about someone getting infected, there's, you know, there's two things. Um, really to think about one is what is the likelihood that you're going to be exposed to the virus 
right? So all of the things that you talked about, about exposure, um, you can control. So you can control by physical distancing, by washing your hands, by wearing a mask, um, by not touching your face, you know, all of those things for the likelihood of exposure, you can control. Once you have been exposed, now it comes down to how good is your intrinsic immune response, your innate immune response, and that's something that's much more, you know, it, it's more challenging, um, you know, to control your immune response. Now, in some ways, if you stay healthy, you know, there, there's, there's a number of things, of course, that will dampen your immune response. So smoking has a huge effect on your immune response. You know, all of the things that you hear about, about healthy eating, healthy living, lots of sleep, you know, you can't completely control your immune response, but you can certainly either help it or not hinder it. Um, but in general, once someone is exposed, this is why uh, they see bigger effects in the elderly because your immune system, immune system does wane as you age. Karen, I'll ask a question now, if I may. One of the things that amazes our guys and me especially is how you've set this up at McMaster University and are going over the 40 minute limit like they have and uh, the uh, expertise that Poppy in your, in your assistant helper has created this special moment. Can you talk about that for, it, for us? How you set it up? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really fortunate because I work with a really, really outstanding team, both in, um, you know, the office of the, the vice president research, but also in my lab. Um, so again, I mean, all, all of the work that gets done and all the science that gets done, I mean, you got to give credit to the folks in the lab that are actually doing the work, especially those working in the level three facility takes three times as long to do anything in, in that containment facility. Um, but, you know, we're very fortunate that, um, you know, I have an entire team here um, and everything for the last while has been dropped to work on different aspects of, of COVID. We're starting to get to the point now where, you know, the four months where we've uh, ignored everything else about running a research office is, is coming back. So people are like, oh, it's summer. It must be better for you. Things are calming down. It's like, well, yeah. COVID's yeah. calming yeah. down. But now the four months of everything that got ignored in the office is, you know, we're starting to have to get back and deal with. Um, I'm just really fortunate because I have a great team and, and they go above and beyond. So um, it makes my life easier. I just noticed on the screen we have a person from Montreal that's watching us. Dave Hay is in Montreal and has picked up his speech. So he's are there any others from out of town that are would it's like to be recognized? Pardon? Salisbury, the UK. The UK. The UK, UK. wow. Yeah. wow. Michael Brewer, right. Michael was a visitor to our club from England, and I just sent him the link. Yeah. And on the off chance that he might come here. Oh, Good to have you back, Michael. Uh, great to see you, Michael. Been yeah. a while. <laughs> That's pretty precious. Anybody else on the line that want to be recognized? Wayne? Jesus. Wayne Campbell? Go uh, ahead. Been, um, you know, for many years we've heard of <clears throat> interferon being used as an anti-rejection drug. Um, now, is there um, a likelihood or a possibility that it can be used in the defense, like artificially produced and used in the defense mechanism for COVID? Yeah, so there are, there are a number of, um, of clinical trials, again, going on. And I think they're actually might be using um, some forms of interferon in the clinic now. Um, it was certainly one of the drugs that was used with the original SARS outbreak. Because if you remember in 2003, there were fewer cases, but higher mortality. Um, and so they did use a form of um, interferon in, in Toronto, at least for sure. Um, and I think there are some forms of interferon they are using clinically. The problem with using interferon is because it has so many different activities, it, it's antiviral, it's um, anti-proliferative, which is why it's used for cancer. It has so many different generic activities. There's a lot of different um, side effects when you use interferon, especially at a high dose. So even though interferon is a very good antiviral, um, it, it, and this is one of the reasons it's also not used in a lot of cancer treatments is because there's a lot of uh, toxic side effects if you don't get the dosing. 
um, just right. Um, and then these viruses are, um, you know, they're, they're tricky. They'll evolve um, to, to counteract the effects of interferon. So, you know, then that's something that we're really interested in is that, that back and forth. Um, although one of the things that we have found is that this virus is not as able as other viruses to counteract the effects of interferon. And we think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people can get infected, um, but the actual um, number that shows symptoms is relatively low. So there's a lot of asymptomatic infections, and we think it's because um, relative to other viruses, this virus can't fight back against um, interferon that's not produced as well as, as some other viruses can. But to use interferon clinically, especially if it's systemic, it has a lot of uh, side effects. Thank you. And Peter Harrison. Um, we've heard uh, quite a lot about phase three studies and quite a range of time frames related to phase three studies. Um, what are the limiting requirements in terms of de determining uh, that a phase three study is successful or not successful? Yeah, so in, in, you know, in this case, it's, um, you know, how many people can you get enrolled in your trial? So it's, um, you know, the more people, that they call it powering the study. So the, the more people that you have, the greater the power you have um, for statistical reasons. Um, and, you, you know, this particular, when you get to phase three for, um, for diseases and for cancer, it also, it's also a time, a time issue. So, you know, here, because so many individuals are infected, but, they're asymptomatic to really understand is a vaccine having the ability to really move the dial on the, the disease status. You can imagine if only 1% of your population gets a robust disease, it's gonna take a long time and a lot of, a lot of uh, individuals to, to really see that, um, to, to really move the needle. Um, so for some of the clinical trials, instead what they're doing, instead of just having um, disease readout or severity of disease readout as an endpoint, they're looking at, you know, the generation of an immune response. Um, that's somewhat problematic. I mean, you can, you can then now look at every person that you're enrolling in your clinical trial to see those with the vaccine versus those with the placebo how, um, you know, how robust of an immune response are they generating? Um, it's easier to collect data that way and you can make assumptions, but then you're making assumptions because we don't yet know what's the, you know, what's the magic, you know, number or, you know, what's the magic level of you have an immune response at this level, that's going to be protective. So that's where this virus becomes challenging because it's not clear that even if you develop an immune response that it's going to be protective. The only way to know that is to see do you actually get a, you know, a symptomatic disease. And since that's such a low percentage of the population anyhow, you can see where you know, it's, it's, it becomes challenging with, um, with really developing the vaccine for this. I suspect they'll look at generation of an immune response because if, if they're looking at moving the dial on when only one percent or you know three percent of the population actually gets a disease uh, that will take a long time to enroll that number of patients so if they if they held these tests in texas or florida or california mm -hmm. they would have a quicker <laughs> turnaround time perhaps yes they would because you know it's it's interesting because you know with, you know, Trump's version of, you know, the more you test, the more you find. That's ab absolutely true. The more you test, the more you'll find. But even if you look at percentages, you know, the percent of people that are tested and positive here is, you know, at least tenfold lower than the percent that, uh, that they're testing um, and are positive down in the States. And again, you know, part of that is who's going for testing. Um, but certainly, you know, there are areas where, you know, heavy, heavy, dense populations and, you know, where that, I wouldn't want to just restrict phase three testing to Canada because it would take a long time because we've done such a good job. Mm -hmm. at keeping right. it all. They also have a methodology apparently where they actually inject, uh, people with the, uh, uh, virus. Um, but I guess that's, that's a last resort type of approach. Um, 
what are the odds of us ever actually putting that into practice? So there are, Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia has a, a facility where, where they can do those types of studies. So it, it is a, a facility specifically um, developed for vaccines um, where they can do what we call challenge experiments. So they can actually now challenge someone who has been given a vaccine or a placebo um, with either you know, a virus or whatever they're, they're testing against in a challenge study. Um, obviously, you know, to get uh, approval for that, um, you know, the ethics to get approval for that is pretty high. And that's done under a very, very controlled situation um, in a clinic um, where they're able to deal with and if somebody does actually get the infection. So we do have the ability also to do that in Canada. I think the only one that has the, the challenge facility is, um, is at Dalhousie. But in instances like that, um, they, they oftentimes, especially with healthy uh, volunteers, they will resort to challenge studies. So we're going to have two more questions. Michael Perr, you're in England right now, right? Yes. You're not yeah. in Canada. No, 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 I'm not. Mm -hmm. right. Tell us, uh, tell us where you are. On, following on about testing um, and the rate of infection and how that can uh, feed into development of a virus. Yeah, it was interesting to me that last week at Oxford University, their research team, a lot of their uh, testing is now being done in Brazil because it's a very high infection rate down oh there. Oh my gosh. Okay. So uh, that makes sense. it go goes with what you're saying, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You gotta go where, where the where the where the news is, sort of thing. Absolutely. The downside they've said of that is of course. Brazilians may have a different immune response than Europeans, yeah. and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. and different ethnic groups have different responses. So. And that's why when you get into phase three clinical trials, they're usually extremely large, multi-centered, and also very, very expensive. Yes. Robert Paul. I, I'm part of a trial involving 150,000 people in the UK. Mm -hmm. I was interested if uh, you have any opinion about uh, the uh, government's idea of opening up the schools in terms of what effect that might have on distribution of the virus from a, a group of academics point of view. So, I, I mean, that, that, that's challenging, right? Um, I mean, I'm fortunate that my two kids are in their early 20s and can take care of themselves and they don't need me to watch over them because if I had little kids at home, I could not have functioned over the last several months. You know, schools, grade schools are different than universities. I mean, universities, as I mentioned, it becomes problematic because we have 40,000 people in a very small footprint. There's no way that we can possibly physically distance if we were to bring the university community back. It would, it would be impossible within the residences, within, within you know, the, the hub where they get their food. We just, we couldn't do it. Schools are a little bit different where they can, well, we'll see how effective that is, where they can potentially physically distance much, much better. We know that um, you know, children don't suffer the same level of infection um, that, you know, that adults do because their immune systems seem to be you know, much more robust. Um, now, does that mean that you know, the, you know, the likelihood, I mean, there, there will be some infections in the schools in the fall. I mean, we, we know that's going to happen. It's much, much easier to control under those um, situations than than it is other places and you know I can appreciate from you know just getting people back to work and you know mental health and for you know student learning it, it is a tough call um, but much easier to to do and to control in um, you know in in that setting than it would be on a university campus I'd like a question from one of the women if they have one that are watching? Guess that's not me, Bob. <laughs> Why are women so much better at resisting this than men? <laughs> <laughs> that's an obvious. 
<laughs> I mean, it, it is an interesting question because we do see with different, you know, different, uh, not all, but with a number of different either diseases or infections, there, there, there can be a, a sex differentiation. Um, sometimes it's hormonal, you know, there, there's different reasons for that. I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm sure someone's looking into that. We haven't been researching that, but, but that is a thing. Um, well, it has the, been shown. The, the rate of, um, death rate for men is twice that of women who are infected. Mm. We're 70 age group, I might add. Okay, I'll have to ask you again. Are there any women that would like to ask a question? <laughs> Please step forward. Michael, you're not a woman. I am not half of a woman. John, All right. Not a woman. I see one hand up. John Carley. Two hands up. He's lying. <laughs> John Carley. Yeah, I was wondering if, if we know how long the virus will live outside the body. Uh, on on different surfaces, you know, is it uh, ten hours or forty eight mm -hmm. hours? And also, I was mm -hmm. just curious That's if some someone dies uh, from the virus, does it stay in that uh, yeah. does it stay in that body yeah. for a longer period of time? So there's there's no absolute answer for you know how long the virus uh, persists on surfaces because it you know again it it, it depends. Um, it is. It's a virus that, so viruses can either be just a protein coat or they can have what we call an, a, an, a lipid envelope. So be surrounded by basically an envelope of lipids. This one is uh, surrounded by an envelope of lipids. So it's much more prone to inactivation um, through, you know, drying out or alcohol, um, anything that will basically disrupt or destroy the lipids or the fat. So this is why hand washing works remarkably well because you're disrupting the, the lipid or the fat on the outside of the virus. So hand washing, anything alcohol-based works remarkably well. Any particular surface, it's also going to depend on, you know, how much virus is it, um, is it in a lipid droplet so it doesn't dry out as fast? Um, you know, how much virus is there? Is it in a human environment? Is it on what type of surface? So that's why there's no one number, but in general, they figure after about 24 to 48 hours, it's likely to dry out. Um, and then once the virus dries out, it, it, it dries out. Um, as far as once someone, you know, passes away, you know, the virus will only survive, um, it will only replicate in living cells. But again, in that environment of, you know, within the blood or, you know, cells or, or whatnot, it, it, it can still survive um, you know, for a while if it's in the right environment. Um, but it won't replicate and make copies of itself unless it's in the living cell. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Jerry to end our call. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Karen. That's uh, quite interesting. Way over my head, I believe. 45 minutes. Um, so we've learned a lot about the SARS, COVID-19, COVID and COVID-19. Uh, anyway, on behalf of all the Provis members here, uh, some of their wives and some friends, we really appreciate learning a little bit about it. And I think that we still got a lot to learn. And from your point of view, there's a long ways to go. And I, I just feel sorry for people that just can't get to see one another and do the things you normally do, you know. It's just just unreal, kind of unreal time. So again, thank you very much from all us Probus members. We really appreciate this. And as Probus members, you know, we like to learn a little bit. And I think we learned a lot today. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I really enjoyed that. And thank you.